We're finally done with a series on the Gospel of Mark. <laughs> and so I believe we're going to start in Romans in the beginning of the year. So in the meantime, uh, there's a number of messages, I guess, until the end of the calendar year that is going to be preached. And Pastor Shine asked me to preach on the matter of worship today. And uh, what I wanted to share with you is a little bit about my own spiritual journey. Um, for me, uh, I'm at a place in my life where I'm really actively trying to learn how to become a beginner again. That's been my prayer to the Lord. God, help me to become like a little child. God, help me. Remind me what it was like to be a beginner. God, give me that heart when I had, when I started 10 and a half years ago in the ministry, like how I served you with a sense of fear and trembling and also this incredible privilege like someone like myself could ever represent you like this. And maybe some of you guys can relate to this uh, uh, place in the spiritual journey as well. I remember in particular, there was this one time where I got invited to speak, and I felt so good about myself. I felt so validated. Wow, I'm getting invited to speak in this place. And I remember the speaking engagement actually went really well. But I remember after that, there was a small voice in my head that came to me, and I felt so empty because there was this gnawing voice like, you know, maybe you like to speak about God more than you love God himself. And when I started to catch that tendency in me where I felt so validated and so it was so good to me, actually there was a period in my life for a number of years when I stopped guest speaking altogether as a result because I was so afraid of where my heart was headed. See, let's uh, put up our PowerPoint and... Um, you can read it for yourself. I'm not going to read it out loud. Um, well, maybe I will. And Richard Foster says this, something maybe you should be familiar with, uh, the idea, but, but it's so much more important for us to understand in our hearts. The divine priority is worship first and service second. Service flows out of worship. Service as a substitute for worship is idolatry. Activity is the enemy of adoration. The famous psychologist Carl Jung once said that busyness is not from the devil, it is the devil itself. And uh, I'm going to ask us to actually go to the next slide, which I will not read, and you can read for yourself. And God has been just continuing to remind me that he's more pleased with purity than he is with professionalism. You know what I've been really blessed by? Even more than some powerful messages from seasoned pastors is testimonies I hear, whether it's at TD or elsewhere, where quote unquote, it's like beginner's testimonies. So even just this past Friday night, one of our brothers shared about his spiritual journey of how he came out of jail uh, after eight years being locked up and, and he was talking about his relationship with God and like, just ah, uh, like it just hit me once again and I was so blessed and challenged by that because maybe in the eyes of people, they may see me and think, oh, he's pastor and oh, here's a guy who came out of jail, but like, I'm like, God, do I have a heart as pure as he does? And if I don't, God, I want it. I remember sharing uh, uh, previously uh, back in February when I spoke, and, and uh, I shared about how I was so blessed by this one particular testimony that our brother Alex shared about how he got nominated to be a leader for India, and he saw all the other groups were led by pastors, and he's like, what the heck is going on? Why am I a leader? And how he couldn't eat, he couldn't sleep, he would have to take work breaks and just pray, God, like, oh, what's going on, and please help. And I got so blessed by that because it reminded me of what I was like 10 and a half years ago. And I'm like, God, why in the world did they put me in charge of junior high ministry? I don't even know anything. I don't know how to preach. No one taught me. No one's teaching me. What do I do? I was like, God, please help. And so I'm in a place in my life where I'm learning to become a beginner again. And perhaps that is the same journey that I can invite you in together. I'm speaking on worship because at the end of the day, worship is about what we love. 
Let's not complicate worship as some kind of service activity with some singing and some preaching and some this and that. Our worship is our profession. It's our confession of our love for God. And so when we even sing songs, the praise part of the worship, see, one of the things that praise and music does is, number one, it has an emotive part of it, right, an emotional response to it. But the other part of it is that with music, we can actually remember words, Right? It's not like you tried hard to memorize that cheesy song from the 80s, right? Or 90s, but you could still sing it today, right? And so it brings into remembrance as we sing what God has done, the truth about God, in a way that we wouldn't be able to always remember because that was a one a command that God gave to the Israelites more than anything else was to remember, remember what God had done, remember who He was. But worship seems like such a waste of time to our utilitarian mindset here at church. It's not like something, you're doing something special for God, right? It's not like, oh, we're going and saving all these souls in India. See, worship feels so wasteful. One of the most extravagant acts of worship we see in the scriptures is, of course, Mary breaking that alabaster jar at the feet of Jesus. Remember, it says it's a year's worth of wages. So in today's term, with $52,000 as a median salary in America, let's say it's a $50,000 perfume, and she breaks it at the feet of Jesus, and the disciples are furious. It's a waste. It's so not practical. You could have fed so many hungry people. How dare you do such a thing? Yesterday, uh, we were talking to this one particular brother who uh, was telling us how he was lacking so much sleep in his life because he would work early in the morning till late at night, but afterwards, he'd go see his girlfriend. And my first thought was, dude, like, you don't have to see her every day, which he was, right? Get some sleep. How can you survive? You can't sleep. Like, you can't live like that. I remember thinking that, but I didn't say it. But I, it actually brought me back into memory when I used to date my wife. And uh, when I was dating her, I, I, it was kind of a secret, actually, uh, because I didn't want her to like, have to deal with all the attention from people at church. And so I told Pastor Shine as my mentor, and I told two other people uh, important in my life. And uh, uh, every night after I was done fairly late uh, at church with my work, I would go pick her up. And we would go to Norm's, you know, off of Euclid, because number one, that was the only place I was open, and number two, no Koreans were there, so we could secretly date, you know? And then I got fat. Um, <laughs> but man, those were good times. Going back to that, right? It feels like such a waste for this brother to have to see his girlfriend every single day. She hasn't changed much, you know, from day to day. Why do you have to see her every day? You're lacking sleep, man. Go sleep. But worship, it seems like a waste, but it actually is so much more important than going to India. It's so much more important than going to TD and serving. And let me get this out of the way. A lot of times we define worship by what we get out of it. Oh, the sermon was good, or the praise team was a little, I don't like their style, this, this, or that. Um, you know, let's get rid of that consumerist mindset. It doesn't matter what you think of the praise hymn. It doesn't matter what you think of the message. Again, why don't we come back to the fundamental question, though? What does God think of my worship? And just leave it there. Because good worship services do not make good worshipers. Good worshipers can join together for a good worship, but a quote-unquote, good worship service, it doesn't really make us into good worshipers. And one of the incredible, of course, confessions we find in the scriptures is King David, right, in Psalm 27, while he is being pursued by the armies of Saul who want to kill him and take away his life, and he is fleeing and fleeing and fleeing, and even in the midst of such a, such a circumstance, he says, the one thing that I ask of the Lord, that I may dwell in his house forever, that I may gaze upon his beauty Incredible. 
when your life is at stake, your life is in peril, and the one thing he asks is that he would gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. And today, brothers and sisters, I want to ask you, have you come today to gaze upon his beauty? Some of us have such a lowered expectation of what to even expect of this time. And I pray that God will change your heart and your mindset to elevate the place of worship in our lives and our gathering. Something special happens during worship because it's not a man-made institution, but it is God's idea. And God designed worship to be a place where He would invite us into His presence. It's a special time. He told the Israelites, his people, that for six days you will work, but on the seventh day will be a Sabbath, and you will gather together in assembly before me on this Sabbath. Let's go to the next slide. And on the title page, it's abiding in or returning to your first love and an invitation to become beginners again. Let's go to the next slide. I'll give you one last example before we go into the heart of the message. Uh, Genesis, of course, is divided into two large sections. Genesis 1 through 11 is about just the whole global cosmic aspect. And then starting with Genesis 12, the focus goes on to one man, Abraham, the father of our faith. And one of the things that we notice with him is this. Now, God tells him to go, so he goes. So in verse 7, look, notice what it says. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So what's the first thing he does? He builds an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. And then in verse 8, From there he went on towards the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Everywhere he would go, he would build an altar before God. See, the scriptures tell us, right, our, our praise is a sacrifice of praise. It says in Hebrews 13, 15. And then not only that, it says, now we offer ourselves, Romans 12, 1, as living sacrifices, for this is your true act of worship before God. One guy who was not a worshiper in the Bible, of course, was Cain. Abel offered God a sacrifice, right, with the fat portions, with the best portions of his flock, whereas Cain, a farmer, just kind of gave whatevers. And God wouldn't accept his offering, but he would accept Abel's. And so what happens? When our worship before God crumbles, everything else in our lives crumble, and our thoughts get filled with corrupt things. And so Cain goes and kills Abel. And one of the funny things that we see in the scriptures is that Cain and all of his descendants thereafter, you know what they do? They go and build fortified cities for their name, and they're trying to make their name great. Whereas what we see with Abraham and his descendants like Jacob did in Bethel, what they always do is they build an altar while Cain's descendants kept on building cities, fortified cities. And so let's go to the next slide, and, and we want to get to the heart of this passage Revelations 2, 1 through 7, the uh, Lord is speaking to the church of Ephesus, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, right? These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. I know you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. And it goes on, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Amen. So here God is speaking, I believe not just to the Ephesus church from 2,000 years ago, but I believe he's speaking today as verse 7 was telling us, he who has ears, let him hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to the churches even today. See, he begins with a great encouragement to these people. 
Just how comforting must it have been for them to trial and, and fight for Jesus' name and to hear from Jesus, you know what, I see everything. I know your deeds. I know your words. I know your perseverance. How you fight for my name, you, 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 uh, you, you know, sniffed out even these false teachers and called them out. You hate wickedness and you called out these uh, evil Nicolaitans. So he says, look, I see your labor and endurance in keeping the purity of the gospel. He credits them for hating what God hates, how giving themselves to the faithful witness of the gospel. And so Jesus is telling us, I know your life intimately, and all your labor is not in vain. And he commends them for their labor. But of course, there's a big but to this story. Jesus actually addresses a very real spiritual problem, even today, very relevant to us, that we have. And that is about abandoning our first love. See, you used to have this pure, passionate love for Him. No one forced you. No one forced you to abandon this love for Christ, but it was our active choice. Notice that word. Here in the NIV version, it says that we forsake uh, in other versions, it says you have left or you have abandoned. It's an active word. You abandoned that first love. It's like maybe some of us, our dads left us. So maybe when you were six, your dad abandoned you. And it doesn't matter what he gives as an excuse. At the end of the day, you're like, well, dad, you abandoned me. And it's the same thing. We're abandoning. We're choosing to leave this love. It's not just kind of happening it, it is our very choice. But why? Why would we do such a thing? And I believe maybe it's because we've outgrown the basics of the Christian faith. Loving God and loving neighbors. We move on to bigger and better things. Notice, wow, that Revelation 2 verses 2 and 3. You know, doesn't that sound so much more important? Right? How you have trialed, you have persevered, how you have stood up for his name. It sounds so much more heroic than loving. It sounds so much more grown up than loving. I mean, loving just sounds like elementary. It's not very glamorous. But what we are called to, brothers and sisters, our first calling, our greatest calling, is our first love. To have a childlike innocence, vitality, hunger, to keep on loving. The British theologian G.K. Chesterton said this, because children have abounding vitality, because in spirit they are fierce and free, therefore they want things repeated and unchanged. They always say, do it again. And the grown-up person does it again until he's nearly dead. For grown-up people are not strong enough to exalt in monotony. Perhaps, but perhaps God is strong enough to exalt in monotony. It's possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun. And every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that he commands it, but because he delights in it. God makes all the daisies. It may actually be that God makes all daisies separately, but has never tired of making them. It may be that God has an eternal appetite of infancy, for we have sinned and grown old, but our Father is younger than us. Two years ago, our family took on, uh, went on our uh, family vacation to San Diego with uh, our two children at the time, and uh, we went to San Diego Zoo. And my daughter, it was the first time she's now seeing these animals live in person. All these animals that she's seen in books that she knows the names for now. She knows giraffe, she knows elephant, she knows rhino and hippo. And I remember going there, and the very first exhibit that we went to was a rhino. And I held her, and she was watching this rhino move. And it was moving this, like, big, giant stone ball. And, and she was like, wow. Wow, wow, like endlessly. 
And so I'm like, okay, the next one, let's go to the giraffe. And she wouldn't let me go. She's like, no, she, she wanted to keep staring at this rhino. So we did. And you know what the funny thing is, what it did to me? Because for me, it's like, okay, I know that's what a rhino is. That's what it looks like. Let's go see the tall giraffes. But then as I was forced to stay in that same place, staring at the same animal, I actually started to see, wow, this animal is incredible. So powerful, so majestic in its movements. And it just really, for the first time, I was captivated by this animal. The very next day, we, of course, went to SeaWorld. And uh, SeaWorld, uh, my children's favorite thing to do ever since that day is feeding the seals with those fish, right? And uh, such a ripoff. Oh, man. Okay, right? That little five little fishes and you pay $5. Before, it was like three for 10. Now, they don't even offer that deal, all right? And so these ripoff artists, right? So we had to pay because, I mean, my kids love it. So she's feeding the seals and it's giving her the joy of her life. And so we come back from vacation. We're home. And of course, my daughter being who she is, we got a role play. So she's like, okay, I got the fish. You're the seal. I'm going to feed you, okay? You have to do this. So I'm like, all right. So it's like, okay, here we go. Or, 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 or. She throws it. Or, 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 or. She throws it. And I'm pretending to have fun. And I kid you not, I don't know how long. It was 20 to 30 minutes. And I thought to myself, this could go on for three or four hours. So I said, no more. Stop, stop. She kept on saying, do it again. Or in Korean, do it again. Endlessly, do it again, do it again, do it again. It's like, no. What does it mean that we have abandoned the love that we had at first? Could it be that we have aged? We have changed? We have become sophisticated like me and lost our childlike innocence to do things again? Could it mean that God wants us to love again, to seek God again, to marvel at his grace again, to feel our need for Jesus again today, and to feel our need for him tomorrow, and to feel our need for him the next day? See, we've lost our childlike simplicity to do these things repeatedly, hungrily, joyfully, as if every day were new. I love how C.S. Lewis wrote in the Chronicles of Narnia, that fantasy novel, right? And the very ending, it talks about what heaven is like. And he says, heaven, it's like this, every day is new. It's like it never ends, but each new day is better than the last. And the next day is better than the last. And the next day is better than the last because it's just new. When Jesus comes back in Revelation, he comes to make all things new. See, loving God as we first did is about living every moment as if it's the first day we fell in love with God. See, sometimes in the midst of all the good works that we do before Jesus, we have departed from this first love. Perhaps in our busyness in serving the church, perhaps even preaching the gospel. We forgot to guard something that is of utmost importance to us, which is our hearts. So what does Jesus tell us to do? What's his prescription if we have lost our first love? He says to remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the works you did at first. Now, I find his uh, prescription a little bit odd because, first of all, to our problem of love, which is a matter of the heart, he gives us a prescription of works to do deeds. And not only that, for us to be made new, he tells us to go back and do old things. See, it's about shifting our view of feelings or our, our view of love from feelings. Like Pastor Shine always says, love is not about feeling. It's about commitment. Right? Shifting our view of love from feeling to faithfulness, this fidelity, this dedicated duty dutifully giving of ourselves even, our time, our lives to someone in real actions, showing commitment through deeds that show care, loyalty, and friendship. 
I, I remember, and some of you may be familiar with this story, it became a worldwide news. It was a story of an elderly Chinese man who took care of his paralyzed wife for 56 years. When they got married, she was 20. And in the fifth month of her marriage, she had an accident and she became paralyzed. And so the husband, he quit his job and lived off of pensions so that he could take care of her full time, boiling her herbal medicine every day, right? Massaging her body endlessly every day, cooking for her, right? Cleaning her body, changing her diapers, changing her bed sheets, and turning her body around constantly every single day. He lived out his love for his wife by diligently doing small, faithful actions that express his dedication to her. Certainly not a glamorous story. It's not some Disney story about a knight in shining armor who rescues the princess. Perhaps that's the kind of Christianity that we're enamored by. You know, we want to be the first to, you know, leave from the EM to be the first missionary. And don't, don't get me wrong, be that person. Go ahead. But don't do it if it's out of self-glory. But this story of this Chinese man captivated the hearts of many in the world because it attests to love being so much more than feelings. It's about real faithful actions, spending time, talking, doing life together, and being by their side. By their side it's a repetition of familiar faithful actions from which love gains its furnace, its fire. See, we are able to love better and we are able to love deeper if we are able to do faithful actions. So I believe God is calling you and me today to go against the natural currents of time and culture that constantly pushes us away from childlike innocence and vitality. He is, go- he is calling us to go back to old familiar actions to fight to preserve the love that you had at first and that this is our first work, our primary work, our first love. See, Jesus, he told, gave a chilling warning where he said, if you do not, I will remove your lampstand. And this lampstand, of course, people, biblical scholars have uh, interpreted in a little bit different ways. But what is sure is that it means that we will lose our identity. This authenticating mark of a Christian was loving God and loving others. And if we lost that, we would lose it all. And God gives also a great, great promise, though, at the end, for those who overcome, those who conquer, I will give you the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. If you remember back in Genesis, Adam and Eve, they were in the Garden of Eden, and there was a tree of the, life, uh, of the knowledge of good and evil, and God said, do not eat from it, for you will surely die. But then there was another tree, and there is, it's a tree of life. And that tree of life is spoken at the end of Revelation as well as being in the center of heaven. And again, that we will be able to eat from this tree of life, that we will be made new again, new again, and new once again by eating from this tree of life. So our call to be conquerors, it could feel so distant from us because it feels like such a militaristic picture. But what God is telling us is that the battlefield is in our hearts where we must overcome by clinging to the love that we had at first for God. When God told Joshua to go and conquer the promised land, God did not tell him to train your army this way and do battle this way. God said, be strong and very courageous and do not let the words of God depart from your mouth. It was always about guarding our hearts. So the way we overcome and the way we win this battlefield of our hearts is through real practical actions that cling to love that we had at first. Let's go to the next slide. 
One of the things that we see in the end times in which we are living in, in the book of Revelations, it constantly talks about worship. In the end times, the Antichrist will start a worship movement, a demonic worship movement that will fight for our hearts, and there are many in the church who will grow cold. Revelation 13, take a look in verse 7. It, meaning the beast, was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. Doesn't that remind you of Revelation 5 when the people of God from every tribe, tongue, and nation are worshiping and exalting Jesus. But now the Antichrist is starting his own worship movement where he temporarily is given authority over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And notice in verse 8 it says all the inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. And all whose names have been, all whose names have, who have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world, who he, whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Let's go to the next slide. And in few verses after that, the second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. The book of Revelation surely has some very strong pictures of what the end times will look like. And God promises that he will shake all the things on the earth until the only only the unshakable things will remain. And God tells us that his kingdom is unshakable and those who will inherit that kingdom will be ones with unshakable hearts. So when we read a passage like this, When we hear that God will shake all things, will you be able to stand? And the honest answer might be, I don't know. Instead of simply having an area, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian, so here. But God is calling forth. God does not need workers. He wants lovers because those who love, there is no limit to where they will go. You know what's funny in the church? There's so much busyness and boredom cohabiting the church. It's kind of weird how they go hand in hand, busyness and boredom. Let's go to the last slide and I'll start to wrap things up with this. The book of Hosea, of course, is a reflection of God's relationship with his people Israel. Hosea was a prophet, Gomer was a, um, uh, was a prostitute, and God was showing his unquenching love to the prostitute Israel. And in verse 16, he says, in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband, you will no longer call me my master. And he goes on in a few verses, I will make you my wife forever, showing you righteousness and justice, unfailing love and compassion. I will be faithful to you and make you mine and you will finally know me as a Lord. Amen. The scriptures, it always tells us, <laughs> there's not a whole lot of things that God searches for, but it says how God searches for those people whose hearts are set before him. You may remember John four twenty three. it says how the Father is seeking out those who will worship him. And in First Chronicles, uh, Second Chronicles sixteen nine, it says how the eyes of the Lord range throughout all the earth, searching, seeking out those whose hearts are fully committed to Him, so that He may strongly support them. They're one and the same. Those whose hearts are fully committed to him, those who are worshipers of Him in spirit and in truth, those are the type of people that God is searching for. Not people who will be, quote, unquote, useful for the kingdom. The end time church needs to really be awakened to this reality of worship that is going to take place with the Antichrist versus, of course, the true King of kings and the Lord of lords. Worship, as Revelation shows us, is our eternal occupation. More so than you being a financier or or a doctor or a lawyer or this or that or teacher. 
That's your eternal occupation that you must succeed in. In worship, God draws us to himself. And even if you may have fallen from where you once were, let me assure you, brothers and sisters, God knows all. And our weak yeses, our weak I love yous, matter greatly to God. And he will honor that. And he will use that to be a springboard to greater things. The last thing I want to say is to give you a practical um, suggestion, challenge that I gave to last service. We have a lot to learn about approaching God with the honor and reverence that is due Him, right? We really need to guard against a casual, indifferent attitude when we are entering the Lord's presence. I sometimes talk about it like worshiping God as if you're punching a, like a time clock, right? As your employ, employee, and it's like, boom, okay, here I showed up here, I, you know? But sometimes I feel like in the church, I mean, we can't even do that. People come late all the time. We're so laid back about God and so laid back about His worship. Now, I'm not saying this to hammer you in the head. I'm not saying this to say words of condemnation. Please get me right. Please don't, don't, uh, um, um, uh, miss, uh, don't confuse my heart's intentions. But could it be that our habitual tardiness is a reflection of what is going on in our hearts as far as our reverence for God and as far as cherishing and valuing worship, again, which is a God-instituting thing where He draws us to Himself in the midst of the worship. I remember um, last, this past Christmas, um, Christmas was on Friday. This year it's on a Sunday. And I remember um, Pastor Eddie told us, those who are in EDU, that we needed to come a little bit early uh, and because there was an EDU part that I needed to do, high school needed to do praise, and et cetera, et cetera. Some of us came early. I particularly remember some pastors grumbling and one of them even declaring and going through with his declaration that, well, I'm not going to come. So we're there. We're there maybe three hours before Friday night worship starts on Christmas Day. And uh, I just, I, I will never forget this. This older lady came in, and then another older gentleman. I mean, they weren't related. They just came separately. And uh, they were praying for the worship. I could overhear a little bit of their prayers. I was so touched, I had to hear what they were saying. I wanted to know what they were praying about. And they were interceding on behalf of Pastor Han. They were praying for the worship three hours before on a Christmas day. And my heart was moved. And I couldn't help but say to God, God, I still got a long ways to go, don't I? Worship is a furnace for our spiritual life. And by the way, I heard <laughs> that the furnace where people are supposed to intercede for prayer it's quite empty these days. Do you think it would make a difference if you came early? Not so much even to intercede for the worship, but to prepare your hearts. There's a huge difference in worship amongst people who come with prepared hearts and unprepared hearts. Believe me, it makes a big difference, and I'm sure some of you guys will understand this, that for even just being there fully for the praise time, allows your heart to receive the word with a greater posture instead of, oh, it's just some music, so I just got to come to the end. I mean, this is not a Pastor Shine show, is it? Like, he's not the only one who needs to pray, right? I mean, it's our collective worship, right? And I want to ask, I want to invite all of us, and I'm sure some of us serve in other departments and so forth, but to kind of hurry your way along. And to even show up 15, 20 minutes before worship every Sunday. More than interceding for this, preparing your own hearts. And while you're at it, to intercede for the worship. And to see the level of difference in the anointing. The level of difference in God's presence that may come when His people wholeheartedly come seeking after Him. And I want to also do one, one last thing, which is to break off the lie. For some of us, it's been so long 
that we have come to accept and believe that you will never love God as much as you used to when you were younger. No, I don't think so. That was 10 years ago when I was a youth, or it was 20 years ago when I was a youth. And I'm here to say that that is a lie of the enemy. In the past, maybe, you loved praising his name so much that instead of saying, oh, I'm just going to miss a little bit of worship, it's like when you were running late, it bothered you inside because you're like, I want to go and I want to praise God. Some of us were so hungry for the word that you used to come and you were like, I want to get every word and not miss a single one. But now we're wondering, when is this guy ever going to end? Or some of us didn't need any coaxing to serve God. We just wanted to serve because it was our honor. It was our joy. It was our privilege. I remember one of our brothers, uh, Aaron Shin, was sharing this testimony a long time ago about how he was sharing the gospel with these guys in downtown Fullerton, you know, where guys go bar hopping and club hopping. And and he was preaching to these guys who were, you know, around his age group, younger guys. And as he was preaching to this one guy, his two friends were, were just surrounding him and just cussing their heads off at him. And while they were cussing at him, this one guy was intently listening, so he kept on sharing. I remember I got so blessed by that. I remember when I was in Korea, every time I rode the subway, Anybody who didn't look Korean, that, and most of these foreigners spoke English, so I would go talk about Jesus to every single one, invite them to church. I always had these cards with church address and so forth. I was such a cornball in high school, right? I tried to connect every conversation to Jesus, you know? So I go to Subway. It's like, oh, can I have that on whole wheat bread? So, oh, we ran out of bread. Well, you know, uh, there's a bread that... <laughs> So stupid, but so pure. I remember when I used to date my wife, and uh, there was one thing I used to do, which was to open her door. And uh, three kids later, and putting kids in car seats, every time we get in the car, I realized that I stopped doing it all together, even when we are alone. And it reminded me, okay, I'm going to go back and to do the things that I used to do at first. Let me assure you, brothers and sisters, you can love God more than you used to. If we repent and go back to what we used to do, if we pray, God, I want to love you like I did. God, I want to love you even more than I did. I am pretty certain that God will be more than delighted to answer that prayer. So let me invite us. India is great. I take nothing away from it. But our little puny worship, the small things that we do here on Sunday, I dare say is more important. TD is amazing. I love it. Every time I go, I, I get so blessed. But let me assure us, brothers and sisters, our worship is greater. So let us strengthen the worship movement in our own hearts before we have to deal with the Antichrist and all his things. Because again, worship is about what we love. Have you tired of doing it again and doing it again and doing it again? Let me invite us. And I certainly know better because I'm learning this again. To become beginners yet again. To become childlike yet again. And to be people who do it again and do it again. And do it again, like the first time. I'm going to, um, I have asked the praise team to lead us into song. So let me ask us to all rise together. And they're going to lead us into three songs. The first song is uh, one of my favorite ones, um, Jesus, I Love You. It says, the old things have passed away. For some of us, maybe this is our, how our lives are. The old things have passed away, but his love remains the same. 
His constant grace remains a cornerstone. And I believe that simple song of declaring, Jesus, I love you, is the most important, is the most fundamental, and is a song that really touches the heart of God. And we're going to close with the song, an oldie but a goodie, right? I sing a simple song of love. That's all we want to do, to bring a simple song of love to my Savior, to my Jesus. So let me invite in all of us to join in song together, to worship our King, and to sing songs of love to Him, and asking that He simply delight in our song together. Let's sing together.